I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am your host, Bill Cortright, and I'm here with the super millennial David Barreto, giving us the millennial perspective. How you doing there, Big Dave? I'm doing good. How's it going? It's going very well on this end. Uh, so we got listeners, kind of we posted it in the community and posted it on Facebook, you know, and this week our topic is personal development, right? And you think about it, we have listeners that are actually actively listening to the podcast in the Ukraine. And if you're listening to us now, our prayers are with you, my friends. We're with you. We're behind you. Just so you know. We're here. And so anything we can do, we're going to try to do it for you, try to bring you in um, as much positive light as we can possibly do from here. You have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I thought it was it was actually a kind of eye opening for me. You know, I check the analytics every once in a while and kind of see how things are going. Uh, I have certain benchmarks that I have set as far as, you know, downloads to kind of celebrate. And when you click on that, the way that the website works, it shows you, you know, the map of all the countries and stuff. And out of curiosity, I just hovered over to see, and, you know, and then you see those two, you know, and when I mean those two, it means two separate listeners. And it's not just by download, it's by actual listens. So that to me just kind of, you know, made me sit back and kind of think about some of the excuses and stuff I've made in the past or, you know, thought about making, you know, as I go along through, you know, personal development and all these things. And the fact that somebody has prioritized, you know, continuing their personal development and their growth is to me like a, a shining light within all that craziness and uncertainty that's going on is that's when we talk about breaking the chain and kind of creating a legacy. That's what that represented kind of to me. We can't even imagine what they're going through. Yeah. There's no way we can imagine it here. It's just impossible, right? So this week, our topic is personal development. Today's Meeting of the Minds, we are going to have a discussion on the science of making bad decisions. Now, speaking of bad decisions, before I get into that, we look like we're going to be doing an event this year in Canada. I don't know if that's a bad decision or not, but <laughs> yeah. we are going to do it. And we'll probably, we'll have, come out with information. We want to see if there's, how many people would be interested in going to Canada in a beautiful place where we will do this. And it will be at the end of the year in the last quarter. And it would be, we, we have an opportunity to do this. And I think we're going to jump on it. And that's where we will uh, launch the new book and we'll Peggy's book and we'll, we'll bring in, I'm working on a couple things with this cause it's rather new, but um, if you can give us some feedback, please do. If you would be interested in going to Canada for us and now we're going to start bringing the details out here the next couple of weeks. And so we'll see if we're going to make that move or if it's, a bad decision. I don't think it could be a bad decision. And our friends in Canada, I know we have a lot of listeners up there. It's kind of nice to do it someplace else. I'm kind of excited for it. So, yeah, that would be a first for me. Yeah. You haven't been to Canada? No. Do you know I filmed my first infomercial there? Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So so I I I don't I've been many decades, but yeah, I did do it. So let's get into this. We're talking this week on personal development, and today we're talking on the science of making bad decisions. And as we talked yesterday that we are each born with this natural propensity for personal development. It's natural. It's how we learn to crawl, stand, and walk. Now, personal development is the, uh, is the process for us to live our potential and purpose. We are each programmed to serve our tribe. Every human being is programmed. And this programming sets your behavior through the identity that was set for you. The stages of development and, hu and the human construct were developed over millions of years and finally set 200,000 years ago as the Homo sapien so the human could survive the savanna plains. Now, today, we no longer need to protect ourselves from wild animals or Mother Nature or feast and famine, yet the human being still functions and operates exactly as it did 
200,000 years ago. And we talked about that yesterday, the importance of understanding that. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything you want to add? No, I, I think that's super important to, to understand kind of why we make these certain decisions in the first place. And then, you know, keeping that as awareness as you go through this episode. <laughs> You're just waiting for this episode, aren't yep. you? So, <laughs> 10,000 years ago, as the human transitioned into the agriculture age, the valley was formed. And the valley formed because tribes with different programming, belief systems, began to live together. And up to this time, there were three stages of development. Stage one, impulsive mind, birth to age seven, the child is downloaded, is downloading the tribe's programming, giving them an identity in the tribe. Stage two, imperial mind, age seven to 16 years, the child gathers experience, is taught skills to support the identity given. And stage three, socialized mind is 16 until they die. The child's identity is set to serve the tribe. And all thought and behavior in this stage is connected to others in the tribe as a whole. And 10,000 years ago, these belief systems and identities began to clash. There was no stage four. Nobody was self-authoring their mind as gather and hunter. Do you mm -hmm. understand that? Yeah. Or do you want me to explain it? No, I, I think, like you said, that's how we survived. There was no questioning to it because that's just how it was. And everybody had the same belief system, the unified belief yeah. system. Because remember, tribes were only 100 people, right? Mm -hmm. And there were several tribes. And of course, if two tribes came together, you had conflict. And maybe you had a little bit of fight there. Or who knows? Mm -hmm. But they just you didn't have that. You didn't have that um, conflict. And then when these 10,000 years ago, when the belief systems and identities began clashing because we started living together, tribes came together, this created separation and that want and need to belong or creating competition, that want or need for approval and be seen, and creating that want for security, the need to feel safe from these others and that want to control the environment. And this is what causes us to defend and attack others who think different, look different, and those who act different. And so you can see that was a big change for the human being when that started to happen. Yeah. And this all came together and created a natural progression of a stage four of development, self-authoring mind, and personal development industry was born. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> that's when it started, right? Anthony Robbins would have been a killer and he would have had it made in those days, right? Because that's what it said. See, the, the drive 10,000 years ago to enter into personal development and climb out of the valley onto the mountain was that what drove the individual was the collective state of humanity was now in the valley. Mm -hmm. Remember, the tribe wasn't used to that at that time and it kind of drove them to want to change or want to up level or become higher social status or whatever it became for me it was like hmm, i don't want to be in my tribe anymore i like the puerto rican woman over there <laughs> <laughs> so just so you know i've been out of my tribe a long time you know yeah. and it really it sounds crazy mm -hmm. but that's exactly what happened so the human being was now living when the valley was set in a state of restriction with a base energy of fear. And it's this state that creates a disconnect to the creation mind. In other words, they have a disconnection to the heart and their individual purpose. And so the human being was looking for an escape from the ego, escape from the fear and escape from that restriction. And this actually was the true development of stoicism, of spiritual teachings. It was all about escaping the valley and moving to the mountain. And what were they doing? They were all in search for the true self. In other words, they lost themselves. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Do you have any comments on that? No, I always think about, a, you know, that game you played when you were younger, Telephone, where it's passed down and passed down. It's skewed and skewed and skewed the longer it goes. And I think that's how, to me, it represents in my head. Maybe the initial moral and reasons for doing it were the right thing to do. But as it generations and tribes and everything starts to mix, 
is that skewing of that message and that moral is the right thing now? And that's how I think of it now. You know, you think of tribes coming together. Where does the fine line of the truth and kind of what's right, you know, come together? Well, if you think about it, the, to move out of that programming, you know, and I want to I want to word this carefully. To move out of the programming that was set for you and create programming that is set by you is personal development. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. This is what Plato was teaching in the allegory of the cave so long before Christ and everything. So this isn't new, people. See, Plato was teaching in the allegory of the cave. The allegory states there exists prisoners chained together in a cave. This is the valley in stage three of development. Now, behind the prisoners is a fire. And between the fire and the prisoners are people carrying puppets or other objects. This is the ego. And the ca this casted a, the shadow on the other side of the wall. And this is the illusion. And the prisoners watch this shadow, believing the shadow to be real. This is perception, which sets expectation. Now, in the allegory, one prisoner becomes free. He sees the fire and realizes the shadows are fake. This is what we call awakening and connecting to the true self. Now, this prisoner escapes from the cave and discovers a whole new world of light outside the cave. This is the mountain. This is when you enter stage four of development. Now, the prisoner returns and tries to free the other prisoners, but they don't believe them. They think he's crazy. This is deaf effect. And mm -hmm. upon his return, he's actually blinded because his eyes were not accustomed to that strong sunlight. And to change prisoners see this and believe they will be harmed if they try to leave. That is the comfort zone of the valley and the fear. This is what is called perceptional blindness. The prisoners remain chained, living the life through the shadow puppets in fear. This is the valley, state of restriction, base energy fear. Yeah. So it was taught a long time before Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So that, and that allegory is still perfect for today. Yeah. In fact, it's in my new book. I talk about it in my new book. I use it in my coaching lessons because it's a simple allegory that Plato was teaching. You see, you have to understand personal development is a process. It involves clarity and connection to the true self. That's you. That's your purpose. That's the heart. That's the creation mind. And it improve, when you do personal development, it improves skills, focus, and teaches you how to fail. You see, personal development will test you, stretch you, confront you with your own shadows, and reveal your true potential. You don't know your true potential if you don't step outside the valley. You really don't know what you can do until you try something. Yeah. That's what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. You don't know how that's going to end up. What the do, we, do people know what you're doing? Or am I? No. Oh, <laughs> Not yet, but... <laughs> so skills and stress mastery are new habits. I don't know, Danny. You got to kind of reveal this pretty damn soon. You've really it's coming up. It's coming up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Shut your mouth, Bill. <laughs> so when we talk about skills, when we talk about skills and stress mastery, these are new habits or new programs. And these are programs set by you to aid your climb on the mountain. And when you begin this, you're always beginning at the base of the mountain in 200 courage and going into 250 neutrality. You see, this skill enhancement will continue. That means you're getting stronger in your skills, your focus, you're getting knowing, you're getting experience, and skill enhancement will continue as long as you live in process. And that's what will bring you to the first summit on the mountain, which is 310 willingness. When you hit this summit, you are no longer chained in the cave. In other words, you're willing to change and you let go of old beliefs. It's old beliefs that keeps you chained to the cave. Mm -hmm. The climb continues. As you continue and mental conditioning actually enhances more focus, skills of meditation, skills of letting go, the skill to slow down, the skill of becoming mindful, the ability to habit create. In other words, 
the ability to control your behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can habit create. We got to understand the human being. It's why we teach it the way we do, because that's what builds towards the next summit on the mountain, the 350 acceptance and 400 reason, which is stage five of development, which I will discuss that more tomorrow when we talk about spiritual development. But personal development begins with courage and must move into neutrality. This results in personal growth. If you go into courage and you can't go into neutrality and be flexible with your plan, you will be making a declaration and fall flat on your ass and not get back up. Yeah. Do you have any comments on that? No, I think the being flexible and the, and the willingness of it to be flexible, because some people will make the, the change out of force or fear, you know, but that to me is not being flexible. That's kind of not trusting the process within it. And I think that is the thing, especially with how everything's happening so fast in the world. And, you know, for me, you know, our brother's wedding and stuff like that is something that I have to be flexible about and go through the process. And I think that's where you have to just be willing and trust the process that you're still going to get where you want to. And the process that you, David, speaks of, this is the process of growth. What is it? It's about making decisions and understanding conflict resolution. If you don't understand the things we talked about yesterday and how the human being operates and functions, you will never, ever attain peace in your life mm -hmm. because you're fighting who you are as a homo sapien human being. You see, during your climb on the mountain, you will make some bad decisions. I'm going to guarantee you will make some bad decisions. So there's a doctor, Ellen Hendrickson, and she explains why at times we make terrible decisions. And this is what she calls the science of making bad decisions. There's science behind it, people. So number one is like versus lust. Scientifically and psychologically speaking, there are two kinds of pleasure to which the brain responds to, liking and wanting. The pleasure known as liking is a state of happiness. It's joy. And the satisfaction, such as gratification, we get after a good meal. Oh, I enjoyed it. But the pleasure of wanting is a little different. This comes from the pleasure in pursuing something and feeling seduction or excitement as we go after it. Basically, it's the lust and the thrill of the chase, such as going after that bad boy when your parents, I remember I had daughters, right? <laughs> <laughs> they go after the bad boy or seeking out a hit after hit of a drug of choice. That's, you know, and so research has shown that dopamine plays a big role in us wanting something. That want, we talk about it all the time. It gives the brain a positive boost and it wants more. And when the brain doesn't get its boost, we want it even more, even though we know we will regret our decision later. We do it anyway. Now, to counter this kind of thinking, one must learn how to slow down. Become mindful of your behavior. This lust thinking is the belief that you will be happy and fulfilled once you get what you want. Happens all the time. And lust isn't always about another person. Lust for money, lust for status, lust for power, lust for that. That's lust. That's want. And to counter this, we also use what we call in stress mastery, the higher goal setting process. Just watch how this works. Number one thing we do in the process is the wants. We have you reveal what you want and why you want something, or why are you lusting after this? Because many times you want it because you're lusting after approval, or you're lusting after the want to belong. You don't even know this if you don't bring it out of the cave and the shadows into the light. And then after you get the wants out, then we take those wants, first we clean it. Now, this is obviously, you really don't want this, because when it's out, it's the ego that wants it, people. When you get it out, it's there. And then number two, we go into desires. Here's where you create the spark. You further break down the want, 
right? But now you connect to what we would like to our purpose and true self. Big difference. This cuts off the ego. You're now connecting to desire and a spark. Now you're connected to your true self. This is why I want it because this is what I'm going for. I don't want to lose weight. No, no, I want health. People talk that crap, but is it true? Because you lust to lose weight. Why? Because you're going to get more approval. People are going to like you more. You think you're going to be more popular. That's what she's talking about. And the challenge with that is it doesn't work. And then the third part of a higher goal setting process is intention. Here is where we remove the future happiness equation. Here's where we take out that declaration of what I'm going to do. I can't. People make declarations out of want. In intention, we remove the future happiness equation and we move what this goal into process and we find the now. And when you do it right, you can't fail. Can't fa How can you fail? You can't because mm -hmm. you're in process. You're already in the identity and the brain is going to react to what you hold in the mind. Yeah. The brain doesn't run you. The mind does. Does that make sense, David? Yeah. And that's also, it's, it's funny. We always mention, you know, what I'm doing and why I'm like kind of not saying it. And to me, I feel like that's because I don't want it to be something I want. When I say it, okay. it's because I've earned it and I've done enough of the work where it's no longer a want. I push Make past Make sure that, you're not doing that. Yeah, that of kind fear. of like honeymoon phase of the thought, you know, and okay. just, oh, it sounds great. It's going to okay. be nice when I achieve it. No, like I've put in enough work to it where I've well, earned I it. You know, it's like respect is earned for me to be able to say I don't know it. why I think everybody knows. I don't know. <laughs> it's on me. I have a... So let's talk about the second thing that the doctor talked about is the science behind bad decision is not having something makes us want it more. Yeah. This is huge in sales. You know, sales training is some of the most manipulative thing you're ever going to go through. When mm -hmm. I And I am so against that because I don't think there's a win-win situation when you're manipulating somebody to buy what you think they should have. Yeah. That's why I like the ready to listen, willing to learn, able to do, right? I don't need to force it. But the big thing in sales is the takeaway. Well, if you don't buy it today, the price is going to go up tomorrow. In health clubs, they do it all the time. Oh, it's $1.99 today. Oh, you got to sign today. Or tomorrow, it's going to be $2.99. Mm -hmm. They do it all the time. They do it. Infomercials do it, right? If you buy today, you, get, you know, it's just, it's just what they're doing is there's a science behind this. Not having something makes us want it more. Human beings, especially that are stuck in the valley, which is 80% of the population, will want what they cannot have. When told that you cannot have something, your brain goes into limbic brain and makes us emotional. Remember, that's the red zone. And we want it more. So if you're told on this diet plan, you cannot have fruit. You will want fruit. You'll think about fruit. You'll become obsessed about fruit. Can't have your coffee creamer. I want my coffee creamer. I need my coffee creamer. I can't live without my coffee creamer. You can't have the new iPhone, but I want the new phone. I want it. And this causes people to spend money they don't have. It causes people to break programs. They don't even know why. And even like to pursue a person who said they're not interested. Well, they're not interested in you. Now I want this person. Mm -hmm. And to take a failure and keep doing the same actions over and over to make it work. You know why people keep doing the actions over and over? Because they realize this is, so, <laughs> they're not, they had habit. It didn't work. What do you mean it didn't work? And they'll keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, but it doesn't, you know? <laughs> right. Now to deal with not having something makes us want it more. It's a long one for the doctor, right? You must move your state into that 250 neutrality that we talk about on the mountain. You see, this is done through using the let go technique as one way. So when you're using the let go technique, the first part is, can I allow it? Well, that's you being on the mountain. That is the courage energy. That is not where you're going to transform. You have to move into the let go technique. Could I let this go? Could I be flexible in process? Could I be explorative? And here you can consciously move process. This is moving you out of that limbic brain. In the limbic brain, you want it. I have to have it. 
I can't believe this doesn't work. I'll keep trying to make it work. I can't believe it. And they'll keep pushing it because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. And when you do the technique, you move out of limit gray red zone and you take control away from the ego as you move into the cortex brain and the green zone where you move, become mindful and you control. And this allows you to move up to that next question. Would I let this go? Am I willing to change? That's the big one because that's what allows you to keep moving on the mountain. But if you got a boulder sitting there and you're just not going to deal with it, you're going to try to knock that boulder off or you're trying to be friends with the boulder, guess what? <laughs> that boulder eventually is going to roll you over. Yeah. You know? And you can see the when you when you start to see the practices that we teach, you can see the power of awareness. You see the practice we teach how can you create the power of awareness? You have to strengthen the prefrontal cortex. That's what the Green Focus Power Hour does. That's what all the things we teach is about te strengthening that cortex brain because you're always going to go into the limbic brain first, always going to go to the emotional brain first. So when something doesn't work, you will always <laughs> get stuck in the valley and want what you cannot have. And not having something makes us want it more because we're stuck in the limbic brain and it's always going to start there. That's why the practices of stress mastery is about strengthening that green zone and being able to move into it. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think the the want what you can't have thing becomes even more now when you get to see like on social media technology and stuff like that. Huge. You know, you get to see the life of millionaires and it's not just in a magazine or in a movie. You know, you're seeing their day to day, you're doing all that stuff. And it looks easy. And like you said, it's always a highlight reel of, you know, things like that. And for some reason, when we look at that, we assume that's how it is all the time. And we want it. And we start talking about how hard our lives are. And that's where that, like you said, the lust for that, you know, yep. the cars. And then money, you want, easy. you know, games, new games come out, new versions mm -hmm. come out, new th computers come out, new phones come out. We got to have it. No, no, we're on a budget, honey. We can't get that right now. I got to have it. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, really? I remember when the new iPhone came out and Linda go, I, I told Linda, what could that new iPhone possibly have that I don't have on mine now? And I, and I, and they had it released. I go, it's going to be the camera watch. Yeah. Sure enough. It was the updated camera and stuff like that. Like I use it at all. Anyways. I said, that, see, but that's me rationally looking at it, you know, because Normally, it'd be like, oh, I have to have it. Mm -hmm. That's the new version. Yeah, and a lot of and people so, just see the face value too when they when they look at stuff like, especially when they they talk about you or you know see you on stage or the job or anything like that. They don't see the work part. They it's almost like the intentional blindness to not. I don't want to deal with work. I don't want to wake up at three. I don't want to diet. I don't want to exercise. I want what he has without that. They and that happens all the end time. Point. Yeah. And so the third aspect of the science of making bad decisions is what the hell effect. This happens once you have misstepped, when you fall back into that valley, you make a mistake, you have a failure, you hit a boulder and the what the hell effect takes place. Well, I've already broken my diet by having this cookie. So what the hell might as well have the rest of the container. When we get caught in a conflict, when we fail to act as we have set our path, when we are not perfect, and that's a big one that people have, we're not perfect, um, the what the hell effect gets activated. And our one bad decision is taken by the ego who takes that conflict and has to blow it up into a problem, causing us to fall back into old behavior or to stop going for our goal in the climb of the mountain. And this will snowball into bigger consequences, making us lose sight of our goals. And the key in dealing with the, what the hell effect is, number one is awareness. You hear us say it all the time. You got to understand the human being's operation and function. You fell. So what? Get up immediately. When you fell as a child trying to walk, you got up. And number two to deal with the what the hell effect is accountability. Have a team, a coach, a group, a friend, somebody you can trust that they will help you without judgment. That's the key. You need that person not to judge you, to understand, help you get back up. No judgment. If they're judging you, 
they're keeping you down and they're going to punish you for your fall, your what the hell effect, right? And number three, you need a journal when these things happen because that brings things to light. You know, ask yourself, what was the state I was in? How did I feel when this happened? And write out that, wow, I'm getting back up right now. I'm back up on the mountain. When you do that, you're releasing programming, but you're bringing out of the cave and the shadow into the light. And number four, you got to learn from every fall. Every time you fall, learn from it. That's what it's for. You don't change without experience. So I'll tell you, anyone who has ever had the courage to climb the mountain will make some terrible decisions along that journey. Always will make a terrible decision. And you might walk by those Girl Scout cookies or down a box of those cookies in your car. You know, just be aware. You might get stuck and defend an attack and say something terrible or send an angry text or email. Just be aware. And sometimes there is bigger falls, falling off the wagon, cheating on a significant other. You must be aware. Now, the awareness I speak of is conflict resolution. It's after the fact. Because if you were aware before the fact, nothing would happen. That is what you want to build up. But nobody has that when they first get on the mountain. So you want to create that awareness, that conflict resolution, so this doesn't keep happening to you. If you quit, it will happen again the next time you do something. So personal development is about personal growth. And this is actually self-development in connection to our true self. And here is where we transform our physical, emotional, intellectual, social, financial aspects of our life. And tomorrow, I'll discuss the spiritual development because it's different. Your thoughts on this, David? Yeah. On the uh, science of bad decisions. I think the one one thing that you, you kind of gave as far as the tip at the end is that it goes for yourself and the, the person you pick to be accountable, that they're going to be brutally honest and not just sugarcoated. Because there's a lot of people, no, it wasn't really that bad. Or no, it's you know, okay. it happens. Or you're normal, you're human, whatever. You just started. Yeah, that's fine. When they tell you, when they call you out, you know, they call you out and then say, just keep going. The positivity of keeping it forward, but really giving that honest thing. And the same thing for yourself to hold yourself accountable. If you screwed up, if you did whatever, like you said, you, you cheated, whatever it is, is to be brutally honest with yourself. It was like, well, she made me mad or no, my job doesn't, you know, whatever it is, take away the excuses and admit and take responsibility and then find out how you can kind of, you know, move around that. And you will get out if you do that. I mean, listen, if your coach is patting you on the back, oh, you poor thing, hire a new coach. And if you want to ask, ask in the community, those that coach with me, not the nicest person on the planet, I don't think. I know I'm not because I have a job. My job is to shepherd you up the mountain, not hold you in the valley. Yeah, because I, I think there's you. a good balance of it. You know, there's it's always you got to have a team of, you know, support to push you forward. But if you're looking at the criticism and the them calling you out as negative, then that's your problem. That's your own because that should be pushing you forward as well. You know, when I get called out on certain things, I accept the responsibility. I sit and I think about it and then realize how I can kind of move forward or at least just have the awareness of it. So the next time I'm doing it, I can kind of catch myself before I get to that point again. But you also don't want somebody who's just beating you down constantly too. You know, right. You have when you fall, push you but that's, ju but that's yeah. judgment also. You know, mm -hmm. it's when you fall, you fall. You already feel bad, right? What you don't want is people to feed a victim story. Mm -hmm. So if they're feeding you, oh, you poor thing, and things like that, no, you don't want that. Yeah. It's like, all right, you fell. You know, what happened? What were you thinking? What what caused that? You know, um, what are you going to do? What can you do? Yeah. Yep, that's it. And, and you, you move them out of there because I don't get shocked when somebody falls because everybody falls. I fall. Oh, perfect. Pretty close, but not there yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I love myself some Bill, though. That's for sure. I love that guy. And it's the truth, though. You have to be brutally honest with yourself. Honesty and self-honesty is one of the hardest things a human being will ever do. 
if they're stuck in the valley, they can't do it. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. You can't be self-honest if the ego has conscious mind control. Wow. Yeah. The ego's telling you, you know, you're great. Yeah, well, it was. The ego's telling you, just like you said, no, no, it was her fault. Yeah. She's the one. She's the one that made me go cheat on her. She's the mm-hmm. one that made me go and, and drink. She's the one that made me go and eat the cookies. Right? You hear it all the time. If you're saying that, people, stop. Nobody outside you can make you feel anything. You have to slow down and take your control back. And you take your control back from who? That voice inside your head. Mm -hmm. Anything else, David? Nope. I think that's it for me. All right, you Canadians, all come together because that's it for today's show. Our mission here is the greatest shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission by simply like, share, and subscribe. Links are right below the show. And as always, until next time, stay inspired.